You know how the saying goes. When it rains, it pours. The Giants fall to the Dallas Cowboys 40 to nothing in a historic beatdown at MetLife Stadium. Was it really as bad as it looked? Was it an aberration? Who's at fault? And what needs to change heading into Arizona? All coming up next on Tommy's Takes. It's time for another episode of Tommy's Takes, covering all things New York Giants. What's up, Giants fans? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Tommy's Takes. As always, I'm your host, Tommy G. You could have been anywhere in the world after that absolute demolition, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. Please hit the subscribe button. Also, check me out on Twitter, Tommy G105, TikTok, Tommy's Takes. I'm everywhere. Unfortunately, last night, felt like we were nowhere. Giants get absolutely demolished, annihilated, picked apart, destroyed. Any word you want to use for it fits perfectly. 40 to nothing to the Dallas Cowboys. In a game where we thought finally the Giants were closing that talent gap that we heard so much about in the offseason, preseason, training camp. In the game where we thought finally the Giants would break the Dak Prescott curse. In the game where we thought the Giants would finally win in the trenches versus the Dallas Cowboys. And I have to say, before I even get into anything, this was probably the worst one of all. This was brutal. Because you start the game, the energy in the MetLife Stadium is electric. The crowd was pumped. Players were focused. Giants get the ball to start the game. Moving it with ease. Seven runs out of the first eight plays. Jones is scrambling. Cowboys don't know where he's at on the field. And boom, literally in the blink of an eye, everything changed. And the left the Giants battered, beaten, and full of question marks. When the dust settled, it was the worst opening game loss for the New York Giants in their 98-year team history. Giants and Cowboys, during that history, have met 122 times. This was the second worst beating Besting only a 52-7 Cowboys victory in 1966. That's how historically bad that Sunday night game was for the Giants and their fans. And everyone thought different. I'll be the first one to come on here. I came on here for the last couple weeks and said, this is a different Giants team. They've improved team speed. They've gotten weapons around Daniel Jones. They went and got themselves the best center in the draft. They've improved speed and middle linebacker. They got two rookie corners out there that run a 4-3 flat, 4-5. Second year of the Joe Shane, Brian Dable, Mike Kafka, Wink Martin, their regime. I came on here and told you it would be different. And not only was it not different, it was flat out embarrassing. This should have been the game where the Giants finally put an end to the Cowboys' dominance. Cowboys O-line was beat up. Tons of questions around Dak Prescott. Tons of questions around that offensive line. Zeke Elliott is gone. Traded for Trey Lance. The Cowboys should have been the team with the pressure on them in that game. But it was the Giants that looked like they were pressing. Looked stressed. Confused. I just couldn't hang with one of the NFL's elite teams. Flat out. Flat out. Again, dominated in the trenches. And I don't even think, honestly, dominated is even a, a fair enough word for what happened in the trenches. Absolute annihilation. When you go back now and you look at last year, all the good energy that came with last year, all the good vibes, and it was legit. Giants went out there, won a bunch of close games. People use that as an excuse to why it was a, 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 a forget, you know, magical season. Doesn't really count. Giants were missing a ton of players last season. Nobody mentions that. But when you look at how that season ended, 
and the 38 to 7 loss to the Eagles, an elite team. After Sunday night, that drubbing to the Eagles stands out a lot more to me. The Giants in three of their last four versus the Dallas Cowboys, Philadelphia Eagles. The fourth game I'm not counting is the final game last season where the Giants didn't play their starters. Eagles only played their starters for three quarters. In those three games in the NFC East, the Giants have been outscored 126 to 129. So, if your bar is the Philadelphia Eagles, if your bar is the Dallas Cowboys, got a long way to go. And for those like myself that thought this rebuild was on fast forward and things were going a lot faster than everyone thought, looking at those three games and that score tells you where the Giants are really at. And the Eagles didn't win the Super Bowl. They weren't the best team. They got there. Cowboys didn't even get to the Super Bowl. They weren't the best team in the league. So the Giants have a long, long way to go. Humbling, sobering dose of reality at MetLife Stadium Sunday night. Cowboys players looking up at the scoreboard. One player even said, wow, I can't believe they, they only scored zero. Only scored zero. Cowboys fans taking over the stands. It's even a Giants fan that threw his jersey into the ground and walked off. It was bad. We're going to break it down, but it was bad. And listen, you, you don't have a must-win game week one, but this was a heavy win if the Giants could have pulled it off. They would have lost another close one. You could say, hey, they're fighting, not there yet. Maybe the second matchup. But this was not a competitive game outside of the first few plays. Unfortunately, let's break it down. Start on the offensive side of the ball. Giants took over, like I said, on offense to start the game. It looked like all the offseason talk about DJ taking the next step. The offense taking the next step was going to come true. Seven of the eight first eight plays were runs. Giants were in the in the red zone. DJ making things happen. And then like we've seen so many times around here over the last decade. One mistake. Andrew Thomas full start. Another mistake. John Michael Schmidt's bad snap. I'm going to talk about that a little later. I thought, I thought his snaps were a problem. I thought his blocking was good. I thought his snaps were a problem. And that was it. The Giants were off to the races with mistakes. Each giant player trying to outbest the other. The Cowboys, uh, Janun Thomas blocking Graham Gano's field goal attempt on that first drive. Returned 58 yards for a touchdown. And boom, just before you even knew it. Giants get it back. Makai Parsons gets a sack. Giants punt. It's 9-0. Field goal Dallas. Giants get it back. Jones hits Barkley over the, slightly over the middle, short pass. He gets popped. Ball popped in the air, counts as a pick, return for a touchdown. Before you even knew it, it was 16-0 in a game where the Giants received the ball, drove it all the way down to the red zone. The blink of an eye, this game was over. But it shouldn't have been over. You know, this Giants team has a case of the shell shocks. And it's always against the elite teams in the NFL. The Giants showed they could beat bad teams. They could beat mediocre teams. They could beat pretty good teams. But when the Giants face off against these elite NFL teams, specifically teams that are elite in the trenches, it starts out bad and gets much worse as the game goes along. And that starts with Daniel Jones. Was this game his fault last night? Absolutely not. We'll get to that in a minute. But you're the quarterback. You're the big money guy. You got the contract. All hell is breaking loose on that field. Pressure's nonstop. 
You could hear a pin drop in what was an electric MetLife Stadium. Giants players shock and awe on their face. As the quarterback, at some point, eventually in one of these games, whether it be versus San Francisco, versus Buffalo, got to see Daniel Jones make one of those plays to get this team back in the game, to turn that tide back around, to overcome that disastrous offensive line that Joe Shane brought back this year. And listen, there were plenty of reasons the Giants got shut out Sunday night. Number one reason by a wide margin was that offensive line. I'm going to be nice. The right side of the offensive line. Mark Lewinsky at right guard. Evan Neal, right tackle. Spent the entire night looking back at their quarterback. Peeling himself off the MetLife turf. or Whatever those pellets are. Jones was sacked seven times. Hit 12 times. Pressured on 66% of his dropbacks. This is why the game was not his fault. But this is two-prong. You don't want to absolve the quarterback fully. You don't. Not when he's going to be a franchise quarterback. Not when he should be a franchise quarterback. I think Daniel Jones gets there eventually this season. But Sunday night looked exactly like the Eagles playoff game. Looked exactly like the first matchup with the Eagles last season. Looked exactly like the second Dallas matchup. It goes bad quickly. The Giants have no shot. Jones puts up pedestrian passing numbers. Maybe it's not his fault. Maybe this wasn't fixed like everyone thought. Maybe Darren Waller, Parrish Campbell, maybe that wasn't the answer. Bringing back Darius Slayton. Maybe more resources should have been put in that offensive line. Listen to some of these numbers. We'll start with Mark Lewinsky. He showed that his regression he's been going through the last couple of seasons is real. And it's accelerating. Glow, as his teammates like to call him, gave up three sacks. Quarterback hit. Five pressures. That made up 24% of his sack hit pressure totals from the entire 2022 season and just 7% of the snaps. That's how bad Mark Lewinsky was Sunday night, Giants fans. Can't pass block. Can't pick up a stunt. Can't pass off with Evan Neal. You know, if you weren't Giants fans, it would be comical watching the right side of the Giants offensive line. I don't know how you trot Mark Lewinsky back out there, even versus Arizona. That's how bad he was. Fortunately, not many options if you're not going to sign someone. I think the Giants should go after Justin Pugh, at least bring him in for a workout. See what he has. But man, that was as embarrassing of a performance you could see from an offensive line. Now, Let's get to the number seven overall pick. Evan Neal worked hard all summer. All you heard is that he was busting his tail. Partnered up with retired all pro tackle Willie Anderson. Said he was ready to have a big sophomore year and rebound. What happens last night? The same exact thing you seen last year. Evan Neal's too slow. Stops moving his feet. Leans. Loses leverage. Bad punch. You name it. If you were to put on an offensive lineman clinic and put on a real old school style and say this is what you do not do at right tackle, that's what Evan Neal is doing. And that's the scary part, because you could sit here all day long and say, well, Andrew Thomas, look at Andrew Thomas. Andrew Thomas did it. Andrew Thomas improved. Look at his first year. That's fine. But where do you see the improvement in Evan Neal's game? Where? Was beat off the snap several times. Scorebook only hasn't given up one sack. But if not for the athleticism of Daniel Jones getting out of the pocket, 
That could have easily been three, four sacks. That right side of the Giants offensive line. And listen, Andrew Thomas wasn't his great self last night. He's hurt. You know, we hold our breaths waiting for that. You know, maybe the news will be out by the time this airs. He had a couple penalties. You know, Ben Bredesen is what he is. He's decent. You know, he's going to get the job done. It's not going to be perfect. Thought John Michael Schmidt did a good job blocking bad snaps, like I said. But that right side of the Giants offensive line, Mark Lewinsky, Evan Neal, if they continue to play at that level, which they've given us no re reason to prove otherwise, they're going to sabotage this season for the New York Giants. What you seen last night was just a fragment. What happens when you go against Bosa in San Francisco? What happens when you go against Buffalo in primetime? What happens when you play the Cowboys again? What happens when you play the Eagles two times towards the end of the season? What happens when you play the Dolphins, who have one of the best young D-lines? How could this right side of this line hold up? An even better question is, how did this GM, head coach, Bobby Johnson, the offensive line coach, trot these guys out there and say, okay, Mark Lewinsky has been regressing the last couple of seasons, one of the worst pass-blocking guards last year, but we're going to coach him up. You know, in his, whatever it is, eighth, ninth year in the NFL, he's going to take that next step now. Evan Neal, I understand. You invested the number seven overall pick in Evan Neal. Too soon to give up on him. He's only played 14 career games, so essentially still in his rookie season. But he's scary. When you look at Evan Neal on tape, it is scary. And you hear about how much he worked out in the summer and, you know, working out with Willie Anderson and so on and so forth. Where is the improvement? Where? Where is the improvement in Evan Neal? Like I said, Daniel Jones had a rough day. Never looked like he was able to get in rhythm. You know, had the one interception that Barkley drops, pops in the air. It was a tough play for Barkley. Got hit almost instantly. Looked like there was someone breaking deep. I think it was Campbell on that same play. But Jones, as he sometimes does, likes to play conservative. And with the blocking, you can't... I mean, I'm not surprised why Jones wants to play conservative. I mean, he's getting pressure within two seconds. He can't even hit his back foot on a three-step drop. Then he had an interception that was a bonehead throw. Trying to make something happen. Right sideline, he's scrambling. You know, you had Waller in the in, in the frame. You had Barkley in the frame. I don't know if the pass was to Waller, Barkley. I'm not sure who it was to. Either way, not a good decision. Interception there. Also looked off on a couple passes. Had, I believe it was an out route to Parrish Campbell towards the right sideline. Had him wide open, missed him. And this is a tough part now with Daniel Jones because you get into year five. Hasn't had a good O-line his whole career. Looks like it's going to be the same thing this year. What do you do? He's under constant pressure, constant duress, but he does look shell-shocked. And we've seen this story several times. And it's always against the elite teams in the NFL. You can't stop but wonder, will you ever see Daniel Jones hit that full potential? When he's playing behind a swinging gate of an offensive line. How can you? If you're a quarterback and you can't scan the field. You can't go through your progressions. You have a rookie in John Michael Schmitz whose snapping was sloppy last in Sunday night's game. John Michael Schmitz uh, snaps I think had an impact on the Giants not being able to execute their short passing game. Snaps were too slow. I get he's trying to be accurate. I get he had the bad snap on the first drive. But the Giants thrive off the quick passing game. Mostly due in part to how bad that offensive line is. But what do you do here? You're not trading for an elite offensive lineman now. No team's giving that up during the season. I took a look at free agent guards and tackles next year. It's not pretty. And this is the problem. When you miss on a, a high draft choice in the first round, it's brutal. 
When you miss on a top 10 pick in the draft, it's awful. But when you miss on a top 10 pick at a desperate area of need, you're in big trouble. So Giants better hope Evan Neal wakes up one of these days soon, implements what he learned during the summer, whatever they've been teaching him, forgets about what happened his rookie year, and snaps out of it. Because the way it's looking right now, I would move Evan Neal to right guard. I don't know what you do at right tackle, whether it's a mix of McKeithen, Pert, whatever you do. I have no idea. There's no clean answer there. But trotting out Glowinski and Neal at right guard and right tackle next week is a scary proposition. You better come with some jumbo sets. You better hope Thomas is healthy. Bredesen plays good. JMS plays good. Jones had 13 carries for 43 yards Sunday night, running for his life. Giants had very little running game. Barkley, 12 carries, 51 yards. Jalen Hyatt and his Giants debut causing a little bit of a stir with a drop that he had. Cutting across the middle. Jones threw it behind him. It was a bad throw, bad drop. Me, personally, if that ball hits your hands and you're an NFL wide receiver, hits two hands, you catch the ball. You're a pro. It has nothing to do with the bad throw. He wasn't catching it one-handed by his feet. It was back here. You catch that ball, rookie. But it was not a good throw. And he had no other targets after that. Zero receptions. Darren Waller, I thought, looked good. Three catches, 36 yards. He's as advertised. Got to get him more involved. His hammy held up, which was good. But all in all, between the Cowboys' pass rush, the Giants getting down early, giving up a defensive and a special teams touchdown to start the game, which is super rare in itself, forced the Giants, Mike Kafka, to abandon the things that made this offense good last year, whether it's the play action, whether it's the bootleg rollouts, the quick short passing game. Obviously, John Michael Schmidt's snaps had something to do with that too. This Giants offense had no shot last night. Yes, they had a field goal blocked. They had a missed field goal. I'm going to get to special teams in a minute. The special teams is disgusting. But other than those two shots, they had nothing for Dallas. They were getting popped. Zaya Hodgins gets stripped on the biggest offensive play of the day for the Giants. Stripped. Barkley fumbles. Jones took a beating. Let me say one more thing here. So, you play Daniel Jones one series in the preseason. You don't want to get the quarterback hurt. You don't want to get the quarterback hurt heading into week one. We need our quarterback healthy. So, was that just for week one? Because Coach Dable, ton of respect for an amazing job last year. I'm not knocking him. Not even necessarily blaming him for Sunday night. You bring your quarterback out. Down 40 to nothing. Your star left tackle is out of the game. It's pouring raining. And you trot him out there to take that beat down? He was walloped on those plays that he was in 40 to nothing. And the answer is, well, I wanted to create a spark. How were you creating a spark? You couldn't even create a spark when Andrew Thomas was in there blocking. Get the quarterback out of there. As disastrous as this game was, and it was disastrous, it was almost unforgivable for the head coach of the Giants. Because if Daniel Jones goes down on one of those sacks, and like I said, he got walloped, that's unforgivable. This Giants season is over. I didn't understand that. I really did not understand that, not even for a minute. Defensively, I mean, hard to tell. It was such a weird game defensively. You know, the sackless streak continues against Dallas. Giants have the number one blitzing, best blitzing defensive coordinator in the NFL for many years now, Wink Martindale. And again, like I told you, last show, zero sacks. Listen to some of these numbers for the defensive line. The vaunted Giants defensive line. That features the number 17 overall pick, the number five overall pick, a second round pick, and a player that has one of the largest cap hits in the NFL right now. 
Okay, Dexter Lawrence, two QB hits, two pressures. Getting to the point with Dexy, you expect that. That's kind of like an okay game for him. Good game for most no tackles. He showed up, put pressure on the quarterback. But that was it. Kayvon Thibodeau, Aziz Ojolari, Leonard Williams. Zero pressures. Zero between all three of those players. Zero. Opening night, Sunday night football, divisional matchup versus the Cowboys. That's scary. So you had both your number five, number seven overall picks. In Joe Shane's first draft, Evan Neal, Kayvon Thibodeau, doing absolutely nothing in Sunday night's game to help this team win. That's a bad sign. So, no pressure. Dak could sit back there, do whatever he wanted. He only passed for 140-something yards. They didn't need much. Cowboys had some success running downhill later in the game. I thought the first half the Giants' run defense was pretty good. Pass coverage, average, huge defensive pass interference on Trey Hawkins. You know, a weird pick play and a missed tackle by McKinney led to another deep pass. Cowboys ended up scoring on both those drives. Rookie Deontay Banks, I thought, played well. He had a penalty, but I thought he played well. He had a 68 PFF grade. Xavier McKinney had a good grade. Dexter Lawrence, Micah McFadden, and seventh-round draft pick defensive tackle Jordan Riley. He played well. Those were the uh, positives for the defense. Now let's get to the special teams. So... You know, we talk about the offensive line for the Giants being bad for over a decade now, right? I did an entire podcast this summer, an hour almost, about Giants offensive lines over the last decade. What happened, where it went wrong, bad draft picks, bad free agent signings, Gettleman, Reese, the whole rigmarole. What about this Giants special teams? When has this Giants special teams been a different maker, positively? Because it's a different maker, difference maker now. It's been a difference maker the last few years, negatively. Last night, Joshua Zudo off the edge on that field goal attempt. Tasked with blocking two Cowboy rushers. Bad coaching. How many of those two defenders does Joshua Zudo block? Zero. Bad football. Goes for a touchdown. Sucks the life out of the stadium. Instead of the Giants being up 3-0, down 6 nothing. Cowboys missed the extra point. Another field goal attempt later in the game. Bad snap, bad hold. Goodell misses it. It's 10 points off the board. Nothing in the way of returns. He didn't kick because he didn't score. So it wasn't much in kick coverage. Other than the second half. Coverage was decent, mediocre. So if you're Brian Dable, you're doing your Monday morning, Tuesday morning review of the game and you're going through, and you're looking at Bobby Johnson, you're looking at special teams coach Thomas McGay, how do you look at them and say, this is okay, we're going to fix this? Even though it was bad all last year and you guys were here and you had 17 games to fix it, now we're going to fix this. Granted, Giants don't have the best talent on the offensive line. Special teams tra- trickles down. If you have a talented roster, you're going to have a talented special teams, v- vice versa if you don't have the talent. But this was a poorly coached game last night. Poorly played, obviously. Tons of mental mistakes by the Giants. Something has to change. Especially on that offensive line. Especially on special teams. Give Daniel Jones a chance to shine. For those that want to blame him and say last night was his fault. And I put some onus on him tonight too. I get it. But if you want to blame Daniel Jones. And you want to put the point the finger at him. Let's do it when he has a clean pocket. Let's do it not when everything is right. But how about when everything is Okay. You know, someone commented that on my Twitter today. Daniel Jones has to have everything perfect for him to succeed. Perfect? 
That was probably one of the worst offensive line performances in NFL history. Giants quarterback was pressured on almost 70, 70 percent of his dropbacks. So we're not talking about everything being perfect for Daniel Jones. Can we just have it decent? And then if he plays bad, you could blame him. Jettison him out of here and, you know, get May and Williams and whoever, all these names, everybody's floated around. It's been like that for the last three years. Can we at least get it decent to see? You know, you got you signed Paris Campbell, you brought back Darius Slayton, you drafted Jalen High, you brought back Saquon Barkley. And you can't see what anybody could do because you have no time to pass the ball. So plain and simple, got to fix this offensive line. It's going to be a hell of a mission now that the season has started. But listen, that's it. Take this game, crumple it up, throw it in the trash. Very winnable game next week at Arizona. Not guaranteed, though. Before the schedule gets really tough. Obviously, the Giants are not on the Cowboys level yet. Definitely not going to be on the Eagles yet. Not until they fix the line. But if the Giants don't get a win next week against Arizona, this conversation is going to be different next week. You know, we're going to talk about last season and what that playoff win did to maybe shroud some realistic expectations that should have been on this team that is still in its second year of a rebuild. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's hope the Giants go into Arizona, protect the quarterback, protect the football, hit some big plays on offense, and get some damn pressure on the quarterback. That's it for tonight's show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Please hit that subscribe button. Check me out, Twitter, TommyG105, TikTok, Tommy's Takes. Let's hope the Giants go for one-on-one next week. Either way, we'll have Cardinals preview coming up in a couple days, and obviously we'll be here for the game. Peace.